so welcome to Death Beyond Coding, and it's uh, exciting to be here. And let's get started. So let me tell you a little bit about me and how I got to where I am, and then we'll talk about how I use my education experience into working with the Agile teams. So um, I'm a retired athlete. I played many, many different sports, and I bring that experience through education to where I got um, psychology background with a master's in sports psychology, and that focuses on individuals' performance. So currently I'm working as a performance coach out of sports eye, and then I work with other clients in the Silicon Valley. You guys have any questions so far? Yeah, no questions, please go ahead. Got it. So here we go, Dev Beyond Coding. How do I base this on and how does Agile work together with combining sports psychology foundations? A couple good th um, things to know is self-efficacy. And self-advocacy is something that uh, was defined by Albert um, Bandura, and he defined it as one self-belief and ability to succeed in specific situations or accomplish a task, which very nicely ties in with Agile and how we want to run the small bits of work to be done, right? And eventually what every good agile professional wants to do is build out autonomy. Have the, and autonomy is ability to make choices according to one's own free will, right? Nobody wants to be told from top down how to do something. They wanna do it on their own inspiration. Mm -hmm. So what does self-efficacy do? Self-efficacy allows us to touch on a few things. It allows us to touch on confidence, it allows us to control um, over motivation. Is it intrinsic or is it extrinsic? Meaning is it personal or outside factors that motivate us in order to get something done? Do we get excited or are we told and we feel forced upon, right? With Agile, we want everybody to feel like we're excited and it's coming from the inside of the person versus here's your story, please go do it, and you have 24 hours. Hopefully that doesn't happen, right? But emergencies come up and then how do you treat them to where you still honor one person's ability and autonomy, okay? So how do we do this as scrum professionals and utilize all this? How do we improve self-efficacy of our team? And not just coders and not just developers, but also our product owner who feel empowered at the same time to they can work together with the team. And how do we increase autonomy, right? Those are some fine levels to reach. And um, to get started, there is a um, Chinese proverb, and it goes something like this. Give a man a fish, and you feed it for a day. Teach a man to fish, and you feed him for life, right? So same thing with our agile teams. How do we bring out autonomy? How do we bring out and increase self-efficacy? We got to look at the whole person. And to do this is with looking at the wellness wheel. Some of you probably have never heard of the wellness wheel. Some of you have. <clears throat> wellness wheel is something that Fahe mentions in the health and wellness book. And it incorporates the whole person. And that's what's important when working with teams. You want to address the whole person. It, they're not just coders when they come and work on the team. They're not just product owners. They bring the whole package to work and from work home and everywhere else if they have anything to do. For example, if you're a father or a mother, you don't stop being that when you are at work and when you're an agile coach, when you're a performance coach, you don't stop doing that when you come home, okay? So the seven parts, I don't know if it's clear for you to read on the screen. It's interpersonal, emotional, physical, social, spiritual, occupational, and environmental, okay? These areas help me have the foundation and some you touch more, some you touch less, right? For example, intellectual, 
you want to make sure that it's a life learner, right? Because engaging in mental stimulation and other stimulating activities that get one person going is important. You want to make sure that people are looking at new technologies, not old technologies. Although old technologies could be good foundation going forward. And you want to be well versed in it. Emotional is good because you want to make sure that people are able to openly express thoughts and feelings, right? There's nothing worse than bucketing it in, bucketing it in, putting it under the rug, and then eventually they have breakdowns, which serves a disruption that one doesn't look for or ideally wants to see happen, okay? And then there's the physical component. And that's um, important to get people proper nutrition, get them exercise, because when you're working with a computer, we're naturally in a sedentary mode. But we know sedentary leads to other factors that are not good or healthy for the individual. And then we have social. And we want to build relationships and networks. We want to be able to help people work in an environment where they're not dreading, oh, God, I got to go work now. Right? Because that hinders autonomy. It may not hinder self-efficacy because people feel, oh, I'm really good at something. But what is really happening? They, they have to be able to work in groups because it's not a one-person show. And then spiritual. What's spiritual, it's not necessarily religion-based, right? It could be from a humanistic perspective. It could be from social activities, um, doing things for social actions and such. And then we have occupational, and that is helping one Look at career versus this is your work, this is your job, and making sure that it's satisfying, making sure that they have something to look for. And then, of course, environmental. What kind of surround, what surrounds you, utilize resources strategically. And when I say resources, I don't mean the people on the team. It's more about if you have good equipment or not good equipment. Do you have a clean office or a dirty office? It all has to do with performance and it will all affect it one way or the other the question is is it empowering and is it uplifting or is it daunting and just pressing you down okay so how do we do this well be smart and focus on self-talk and the key points here is smart goals dimensions of attention and this and the talk that takes place so SMART goals is something that, whether you run Kanban, Lean, or Scrum, it doesn't matter. What matters is what specifically that you identify that you're working on. Having that ability to be as specific as possible, and this is where having smaller stories versus bigger is important because smaller things are easier to accomplish. Now, when you know specifically what you're going to do, how are you going to measure it? Measuring is a way of knowing did you accomplish it or not. And in order for you to accomplish something, you got to know what actions do you have to take. So you have to have action oriented. And you got to make sure that whoever is setting the goal when they're specific and they know what they're going to measure, that it's also realistic. And of course, because we all know that we all sometimes say we're going to do laundry tomorrow and tomorrow we're going to say we're going to do it tomorrow. We got to make sure we give ourselves a deadline. Now, this um, different foundations of Agile, they support it some more for the timed part and some that are looser, that have more autonomy on when you get it done. And this is why you have to be very disciplined in order to have less time box than more, okay? So for example, a smart goal could be in a simple developer world, somebody having to write hello world, all right? Something basic that it's like the first thing you learn. So a specific goal would be, be able to write hello world that comes in through the web. How will you measure it is, does it actually come in through the web or it's not? And can you see hello world on the screen? The actions you need to take is something like opening a document, saving it in the proper format, 
and then making sure the internet's there connected so you can pass it through. You would ask the individual, is this realistic? Of course, any coder that's been in the field, even for a little bit, it should be realistic and they should be able to say yes. If someone says no, at that point, you want to make sure to go back and revisit the specific goal until they say yes, it's realistic for them. And the time, well, this is something that should be probably five minutes or less. And that would be the SMART goal that you set. Now, setting SMART goals is one aspect to build out self-efficacy and also autonomy. Because does the person motivate it on their own or are they being told to do this? How is this being brought in? So then we want to talk about the dimensions of attention. As an agile professional, sometimes you have to focus on different parts. But what are the different dimensions, right? Um, this could be attention um, from internal to external and from broad to narrow. Sometimes you have to be more specific and you have to be very narrow to what you're looking to accomplish. And sometimes you have to be broad. So for example, if you have a specific set of stories, you wanna be specifically narrowing down on what you will accomplish as a team for the sprint, regardless of how many weeks you run it. But when you're looking to do grooming and plan out the next set, you wanna look at the broad picture. What is more important for us to do? And how will we do it? How do we break it down? And you constantly do this switchbacks and forth from broad to narrow. Narrow, of course, as you understand, it's the little small segment and broad is the big overall picture. And then there is the whole internal, external, or looking at, is it within the team scope or is it the external factors that are blocking us? And these are some of the things that are good to use as a guide for when you're dealing with impediments. Is it within the team that we have to address or is it outside external factors that we have to figure out a way how to get somebody else to help us solve this problem because it's beyond our scope. And as you're going through these SMART goals, you're looking at where should you focus, then as a Scrum professional, you have to pay attention to what self-talk is happening within the team. And not only do you wanna focus on self-talk of yourself, but you also want to focus on what's happening with you and how are you looking at things and are you modeling what you're asking your team to do. Self-talk is the internal dialogue, but it's also what is being talked about verbally to the whole team. So, for example, the team could be saying, oh, this is a great idea. And then somebody else says, oh, yeah, totally. Let's figure out how to do this. So that could be an example of self-talk that is positive. And then other times we have examples of when somebody will say, oh, we're all failing, so-and-so isn't doing their, doing their job, they're slacking, and then that's negative. Now, how do you help them transition from a negative to a positive, right? All these things make a difference on how you mediate and how the whole attention works. Right, Because when we're focusing on the wrong thing, and if it's a little thing that doesn't make a lot of difference, then we're not focusing on things that actually matter and that are important, that are helping us win. Right, But what's important now? And how do you actually focus on the right thing? Well, you set the goal and you committed yourself to it, so then now we need to be able to focus on how to accomplish it. If we're focusing on this goal, then we got to be on the smaller picture versus the whole picture. And then how we do the dialogue is also important because it's not just in a retrospective that we want to listen to people's dialogue and how they're talking. We want to make sure that we are addressing individuals all the time. And when I say addressing, I don't mean where you scold them and you say, hey, what's wrong with you? Why are you talking like this? But it's more about looking at how do we improve and how do we grow and then you start thinking okay 
as a scrum professional, what can I do? What will be the next best thing to grow the team? Okay. All right, everyone mute it and therefore stopping for questions not necessary. Uh, I think people can ask the question. So they, they are muted just because to pay the attention. But okay, can, got it. Yeah. So then does anyone have any questions? All right, so it sounds like there's no questions. I'll just keep going. Um, uh, actually, there was one question from Bhuvan. Oh, I'm sorry. So my screen is completely blocked with the slides. So if yes. You could tell yeah. The so, so the question is, uh, is there a difference between the self-efficacy and self-organization? So self-efficacy and self-organization are different things. They're not the same thing. Or self-organization is you have five people and they have to somehow organize to work. And usually in a simple setting when you're at work you know you have to work with these people it doesn't mean you're going to organize yourself in the best way or you're going to believe that what you have to do is reasonable and you can believe in yourself or self-efficacy for example um i have never played cricket in my in my life for example right but because i know i have played many different sports i'm gonna have a pretty strong self-belief that I will succeed if I was to step on the field and have to play that game. Now, because I come from a non-coding background, as my experience, as I mentioned, has been all but in psychology, if somebody told me I need to write a piece of code, my self-efficacy is going to be very flat. But I can still organize myself and still be able to get things going. Right? It doesn't mean it will be the right code. Does that make sense? I, I think it, it does. You can continue. Okay. So, looks like some screen popped up. Sorry. Um, so, setting smart goals is baby steps of doing things. And the other thing that's important is when you're running retros, um, oftentimes people say no finger pointing and you got to be able to come up with a way how are you going to accomplish but then I like to take things to where of course the team has to be prepared and willing to do it is setting smart goals when you're wrapping up um, actions that you're going to take away from the retro even if it's one thing and having somebody take the ownership of it the other thing that's important is Noticing how the dialogue of retros or the self-talk for within the person and that you have for yourself is switching also, right? If everything's evolutionary change and improvement, then we have to be looking at all different angles. Okay. So with that said, how does this all tie in and relate? Um, how is this relating to Agile? Looking at the seven different dimensions of the wellness wheel. And also, how is it tying in with, as I mentioned, be smart and uh, focus on the self-talk? So the way I like to look at it is what the environment is, what kind of environment are you creating? Are you creating a very clean, refreshing environment? Because the environment that we have will either help our performance or it will hinder it. It will get in the way right if we live and work in better more upscale areas it doesn't mean the environment can't be polluted if we are never cleaning our desks and we're leaving old food on the table it's gonna create a pretty not pleasant environment for a lot of people whereas if we keep it clean refresh make sure people are not leaving their soda cans and etc around then we're gonna keep things fresh and it will definitely make a difference in how the office feels and how the team area feels. Motivating people to physically move is another big aspect, right? One thing that's important is caution and giving out personal advice on how to get in shape and such, but you still can 
encourage people to stretch and maybe just reach for the ceiling or some some simple things where you don't have to be a personal trainer certified by any governing bodies or anything and still be able to under uh, help the team go the other thing that i like to do is use the environment like i work in an office building that has lots of stores i'm sorry stories and with that i encourage people they say oh i had a big lunch and i'm like oh you know we do have the stairs like just go walk five flights and it will already make you feel a little like loosened up and you walk five up you walk five down back to the office and it kind of gets your blood going when you get the blood going you can get refreshed ideas and there's much more that goes behind it and then you want to encourage people being life learners it doesn't mean they go to school 24 7 for the rest of their life but you want to find ways to challenge people intellectually emotions are mixed no fine lines and you want to accept people the way they are. So if you know somebody is a new father and probably not sleeping nights because there's a crying baby, just be understanding and help them to work as a team. It's not where we throw stories over the fence and say, hey, you know, this is your job. You need to get it done. I don't care how you get it done. But you have a teammate. Hey, can you help me out? I'm having a really rough time. It's hard to balance, right? Of course, somebody that's been in similar shoes and is a parent themselves, they will understand it more. Somebody that may not have been a parent, they won't understand it as much and it's hard for them to grasp. But emotions, there's no fine lines. You can't remove your lack of sleep and that's causing you to think about nothing but, oh man, are my basic needs being met or not, right? It will get in the way. Other times people get into relationships and all this creates excitement to where they're not thinking about what is needing to be done in the office and instead they will think about, oh, I'm excited, I can't wait to go on a date with this person, right? And this is where we gotta help them focus. When you're here in the office, yeah, hey, you got life going on, that's great, but how do we help you focus on this task? And that's why setting smart, Small and smart goals helps them break it down, okay? Social events are very, very important. You wanna have people mingle, you wanna break up the clicks, and you wanna have people be comfortable because if people are comfortable within a certain area, then when they need help to work on a story or get a task or bug fixed, they will be more likely to go and talk to the person instead of waiting till some somebody comes to them and this is very important because a lot of developers a lot of product owners don't like to interact although it should be and it's very helpful and beneficial in many ways i'm sure you guys know this um they don't want to interact they just want to look at the screen and a lot of people are also that way they'd rather be on the screen than interact so have fun events even if it's simple as drink and talk this is one of the things that i have used in the past even with distributed teams, you can certainly do. Everybody can grab a glass of water, get on the camera or in the room, and you drink some water, which is good and healthy for you. And at the same time, you have mingle. Hey, how's it going? Got any fun plans? And then if you're on the video, people will notice different backgrounds. If you're working out of coffee shops or whatever, and they pick up the dialogues and they're like, oh, what's that painting behind you? Where are you located? And it's a matter of getting people comfortable to talk to each other and wanting to interact with one another and of course if you have budget for bigger events like picnic in the park family outings etc that's also like a big thing and then for the spirituality you want to establish a positive attitude in the office you want to be able to guide the individuals and the team to where they see the big picture of what is the purpose and what is the need of this project that's going to help the company overall and you constantly want to be reinforcing that because if you have some value that is never being discussed about then it's not meaningful at all and you want to have meaningful things because as our spirit gets excited we're going to be more passionate about it then we're not going to think about it oh this is a daunting task to where I am on a mission. I want to do this because this is fun and this is what I thrive for. This is what gets my blood flowing and it gets me 
on a different level versus somebody that is completely down, don't believe in the product, they don't believe in the process, and they're going to be just down, and they're going to be like, why and how? And it's going to be like so unpleasant to do that. And then, of course, you want to guide your teams to grow. And oftentimes, it's like growing their careers. But as you looked at the seven dimensions of the wellness wheel, it can be done in many different ways. It could be where maybe they are a really big introvert and you help them slowly come out of that shelf on how to be social more within people, right? Maybe that's working to where going to lunch and that is a big threat sometimes to people. But either way, you want to grow them. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in <clears throat> teaching them the language to code that they want to use or whatnot. So this is how it all ties in. You want to focus on the whole person. You want to be able to um, address the SMART goals. And you want to be able to help build out the autonomy by bringing up the self-efficacy, their self-belief that they can accomplish something and they will be able to successfully deliver the stories that are being selected. And that's my talk for you guys today on looking at Dev Beyond Coding. So are there questions? So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the screen so I can see if somebody's writing anything in the room. Oh, it looks like in the chat there's three, so let me see. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, I think the, at least from my side, the, they are not questions, but uh, what I feel is that, um, I mean, uh, apart from uh, whatever the, the mechanics we talk about in Agile, uh, these soft as aspects are pretty important. Uh, the empathy, the aspect you just mentioned, uh, is also a very, very important part of the way you work. So most of the times, I think uh, people just think in terms of the me mechanics, but these things are also the meat of the game. And uh, your conversation helped in uh, identifying them as well. Thanks. Excellent. My pleasure. Um, let's see, somebody wrote, I do have takeaways in terms of personal coaching. Most of us usually think about the group or the team aspect. You're welcome. Yeah, and you know, one thing that's important is, I notice a lot of people usually will say, I've been working with, let's say, three teams, four, four or five teams, or however many over time. And they say, this is what I found based on my experience. Well, if you found something based on your experience, go look with what has been published like studies wise and see what is actually backing it up and is it an anecdotal data that you can now contribute to the bigger picture or has it been used in the past and you can grow it and make it that much stronger because when we tell people oh it's just my opinion well then they're just gonna think oh how valuable is that it's your opinion but if you can say that you know it was developed in 73 and then it's been worked on year over year and it's over 50 years then you're gonna be like whoa that much stronger and then you come across that much more knowledgeable and being able to scientifically back things up so one question from my side is that uh, uh, what are the different activities uh, you have done with the team uh, which uh, I mean, work for you, and also you've uh, found certain changes uh, in the team and uh, team members. I am a big advocate of team building. I will do the silliest games in order to get teams outside their comfort zone because then they're more likely to do things work related outside their comfort zone, too because they'll feel comfortable to make mistakes. And it's about creating that environment to where one is comfortable doing the risk taking, 
and taking challenges, right? So I am really, really big on team building. And that's why I was asking people in the one of the Slack rooms, what are the activities that you guys do? Because I'm always on a hunt for more. Um, so like I mentioned, drink and talk, that's my big thing that I do with teams that are on location and also with distributed teams. It really helps to get the dialogue going for people outside of the work um, lines. So it's not about, hey, how's your project going? It's more about, hey, where are you right now? And just get simple talk going, right? Every time we look at things that are advanced, we wanna break it down to simple and simply saying hello and how are you doing will be very touching and meaningful to um, the other individual to see that care and that understanding, right? And maybe they say, oh, hey, I have something going on. Then it will make more sense to why they're behaving the way that they are. Right, so I'm a really, really big fan of team building and drink and talk is one of the things that I really try to encounter and promote within the teams. Uh, one of the things uh, which uh, I have seen or uh, have firm believe on that, uh, uh, at least from the distributed team's point of view, is most of the times uh, uh, because people uh, focus on the work, so the, uh, the discussions are pretty technical. Um, and then uh, you lose the understanding about that person itself. So I'm just, I, I was thinking that maybe start having cert certain personal talks before you start getting into technical stuff uh, is much more powerful than just continuing with the whole mechanical stuff all the time. Right, and you're definitely right on that. It's just the question is getting people to actually be willing to talk about personal stuff right if you're gonna ask hey how's your married life in front of some in front of the group they're gonna look at you like are you are you out of your mind but if you say hey how was your weekend what kind of cool activities did you do and then at the same time be able to share your activities so you got to give and take and when the team sees that you're human they're gonna be more likely to share with you and what you do is you also establish credibility to them being comfortable to come and talk to you when they have a problem whether it's work or non-work related. Sure. Yeah, so setting up the safety net and having different ways to execute it is vital. 100% agree with you. Uh, any other question from anybody else? Yeah. Uh, hi, Lena, this is Vatsalya. Uh, I have a question. Um, most of the agile coaches that we see around, they generally come from a technical background. Since you come from a non-technical background, that you from sports. So what, uh, ex like, as a sportsman, there are generally tendencies to excel and to be, like, to be the top of the world. So how does that feeling or your experience translates to a team as a collective team to cross certain barriers which they would not have done in their uh, regular iterations or regular sprints? Like, what are the motivation factors, the team thought that you probably, they, they got it from you being a sports person with your experience? The, yeah, you see what's interesting about sports, not everybody wants to be the best. The top factors to why people start playing sports is because they want to belong, they want to maybe learn a new skill, and they want to have fun. And if you can implement that within the work world, then it definitely helps with morale. It definitely helps with how the work dynamic happens. Now, as far as excelling things, um, well, it depends on what factors you're looking at and what is the next step, right? If you're spending 100K to do a project and everything else is up to top line, everybody's you know, top notch, they have delivered every story, well, then you take on more stories. How can we do it quicker? And you look at different ways of maybe cycle time, maybe delivery. Maybe you're looking how to have continuous integration and that helps you execute faster. But there's always ways to grow and improve. It's just what you're looking for. And I can't say this is like the standard um, backbone that every team has to use. And you got to look at case by case with how the team is. Is it a five-person team or is it a seven-person team? Is it where you're looking to, oh, can we get enough product out there so we can hire one more person? You know what I mean? 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, I I just add like suppose as, as a sports fan, sometimes we have your highs and lows. You enjoy sports, but sometimes you may not be at your best. But at some times you probably would be excelling at what you're doing. So there's a wave going on, like a sine curve. When you're pretty good, when you're not, you know, you're just doing okay. So when as a team there will be certain instances where the team has done really well, or the team has not been able to do. Uh, they've been just doing okay. So when they're just doing okay and they want to say, okay, my four spins did not go too well. Now probably I should, as a team, take cover that up, take the graph a bit higher. So how do you motivate that, or how does the based on your experience, how do the teams pull themselves in and say, hey, we are ready for more. Let's cover up what we have uh, slackened up in the last couple of sprints. Yeah, so you got to look at what's not going right, and then you got to think, how, what can we do to pre mine It's kind of like looking pre-performance routine and such. Um, looks like this is about to get cut off, so um, if you have further questions, you're all definitely welcome to reach out, and we can do um, a further discussion. But um, otherwise, ju um, there's a platform, actually, and a product that SportsEye is rolling out within this year, SPMK, that is going to be exactly what you're talking about, helping teams and individuals understand what is our part and how do we go beyond that and how do we grow and improve. All right. Well, thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure and hopefully you enjoyed the session and had a good takeaways. Have a good rest of the night or a good rest of the day, depending on your time zone. Yep. Thank you so much, Lena. Thank you. Thanks, Lena. Thank you. You are all welcome. Bye. Bye-bye.